Welcome into episode 53 of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. I'm Nicholas Raba. And I'm Nicholas Tachek. There are things I know I know about security, but I don't know why I know them. I mean, I know them because people have told me, but I don't know why or how. For example, we all know that an unsecured Internet of Things thing, uh, like a smart light bulb or a web-connected picture frame, those things can become a part of a botnet or a dedicated denial-of-service attack. Now, we know this because everybody says, it's so. But how does that happen? That's the topic of today's show. How many light bulbs does it take to change the internet? Now, I I mean, we did an Internet of Things episode. I know that an Internet of Things thing that is not secured can wreak havoc. But what I don't understand is how. How? So I mean, I guess I guess go first through the part where my light bulb can you know help destroy the universe. Uh, all right. So uh, basically, to start with, an attacker will need to uh, to to get access to your light bulb. Mm-hmm. Or actually, let me let me back up one step. First of all, you'll need to have a light bulb that has a vulnerability. Um, either one that is known publicly that's been disclosed by a security researcher or a hacker um, or one that's known privately that you know, said security researcher or hacker has kept to themselves. Uh, so so that's the first thing. You have to be running something vulnerable. You have to have it plugged in, turned on. And uh, generally, you have to have kind of left it at its default settings. Um, a lot of times, uh, a username and password is needed to make changes on these devices and when combined with a vulnerability can basically allow an attacker to, to get further than just turning on and off the lights in your house. They can actually take over the light bulb itself and make it do other stuff that it wasn't never intended to do. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the first, the first thing that needs to be kind of in place before an attacker can even uh, start. And then they need to be able to figure out that you have said light bulb in, in your house. How did they figure that out? Right, exactly. I mean, they're not coming to my house and checking my light bulbs. I mean, how do, like, how does somebody find out that, I mean, if I don't even know that I have an Internet of Things, things that's not secured, how does somebody else find that out? Well, that would be by scanning the Internet. Um, basically, uh, there's software out there that will run through the IP addresses, the uh, Internet protocol addresses of anything connected to the Internet. And depending on the scan software used, it can actually go really fast. I think there's some software out there that can scan pretty much the entirety of the internet in a very, very short amount of time. And they'll scan specifically looking for kind of the fingerprint of that light bulb. There are certain ports open or certain responses that it'll get back when it's scanning and trying to connect to it uh, that will indicate that it's this this or that light bulb or or any other internet of things device and that's the way that they will identify vulnerable devices and i mean there are people running scans like this every single day all around the world if you ever happen to look at the firewall log for your your wi-fi router your modem you'll generally see that it's blocking a lot of these scan attempts from all around the world. So it's not, you know, just one person doing it. I mean, there are, there are hundreds, thousands of people doing this on a daily basis or automated uh, systems doing it just specifically to look for holes like that. And they've even built search engines yeah. for things like this, like uh, Shodan. What's that? It's a search engine that will, you can basically, it's like Google for vulnerable systems. <laughs> so back when... There was a lot of talk about the industrial systems. The I believe it's SCADA is how it's pronounced, SCADA maybe. Back with the industrial systems uh, that were vulnerable, so power plants or water uh, filtration systems, that kind of stuff. There was a, a lot of stuff in the news a couple of years ago about how all these things were connected to the internet, even though it probably shouldn't be. And so the search engine actually allows you to specify what kind of system you want to look for that's connected to the internet and so people were able to find oh hey look there's a power plant that's connected to the internet with a vulnerable system uh so it's it makes it really easy to locate um 
those type of vulnerable devices without necessarily going through the steps of scanning the systems yourself. Yeah, I just loaded up their website right now, and it says the search engine for power plants, and then it rotates the Internet of Things, refrigerators, security, webcams, basically anything that is connected to the Internet that they could build signatures on to identify. You could search for those connected devices. Okay, I want to I want to go two directions. Um, don't let me forget that I want to find out how it is that a thing that lights up my room can actually do something besides light up my room. But where we're talking about the ability to find insecure devices or unsecured devices or whichever, I believe, uh, uh, Mr. Tachak, what you said at the beginning was, I need to be running a light bulb that hasn't been updated, or I need to be running a vulnerable light bulb. Is is the problem as far as people being able to search it, is the issue the light bulb or is the issue my general security? I mean, I would think theoretically if I've got my light bulb turned on and and connected and it's connected to my router, if my router's secure, then my light bulb should be secure as well, should it not? Uh, it's kind of... Well, that's chicken and egg right there. <laughs> it kind of depends. Um, in the first place, the security has to be either in place from the beginning from the vendor or they have to have issued an update that will put security in place. Uh, a lot of times vendors don't think about security. They don't care about security. Uh, they don't have the money to care about security. They just want to get to market with their product and they don't think about the consequences. So you end up with a situation where you know, you've know you got all this stuff on the market. It, the company that sold it may or may not have folded in the meantime. It's not going to get any more updates or it'll be really uh, low chance of getting updates, special security updates. So it might not even be possible for you to secure the device. But the other side of it is it is up to the user then to think about checking for updates, installing those updates. And it's not always the easiest thing to do or something you even think about. Now, if you are behind a, uh, a router and the device is set up correctly, so it's you know only accessible on your local network, you've greatly increased the security and the precautions you've taken there. Uh, The downside is that some of those devices out of the box aren't just set up to be local on your own network. There uh, were a number of webcams uh, a few years ago that by default would join like a a peer-to-peer network of other webcams. And it was so you could see webcams around the world and it didn't really tell you it was going to set up that way. So your webcam was basically set up specifically to be able to access outside of uh, of your local network, and then it gave a foothold for the bad guys. Uh, the other possibility would be if your router itself has a vulnerability. And when's the last time you logged into your router to check to see if there's new firmware for it? I mean, <laughs> do, you th- do you think that your cable provider or whoever is doing updates? They do. Do they? Do all of them? Not all of them, but a lot of the major (laughs) ones. If you're talking about any of the major companies, uh, the major providers, they are going to be updating. A lot of them actually have the the ability to do it remotely or automatically, uh, where the modem will check for updates and install them on its own. If you're talking about a smaller like mom and pop ISP, something that's really only local to your area, and they're handing out you know, kind of generic equipment and there you have to configure it specifically for that ISP. Yeah, there's more of a chance that it's not necessarily set up for an automatic uh, update system in that regard. Think about it as like smart TVs. Some, well, most smart TVs, once that generation of the TV is over with, they're not updating the firmware on it anymore, right? So they're just going, here you go. We hope that it works with all of the APIs that we connect with. We hope. And it's really only when your apps on your TV aren't working anymore. You're submitting questions or maybe you're just connecting via another device to use those type of services to watch it on your TV. So there's that trust there with the provider. And you did say that a lot of the major ISPs will push updates I think they have more of an incentive because you're paying them a monthly subscription. When you buy that TV, uh, you pay once at the store, and so they don't really care. They've already gotten paid for the TV, so supporting it in the future, pretty hit or miss. Oh, I I do see where you're coming from there. 
I mean, the incentive you're paying the monthly fee to your service provider. But I've logged into hardware before. I've logged into clients' machines, things like that, and their hardware hasn't been updated. Or maybe they configured it feeling like they were going to be on top of security and they don't allow remote administration Mm -hmm. or remote updates or things like that. I mean, do you allow those? You've also got the problem, I would think, of most people are on their cable system and most cable systems, uh, there's only one in a given city. I mean, go back to the to the conversation we had a few weeks ago about Yahoo, right? Yahoo had something like a like a billion records hacked, but they're Yahoo. I mean, they're so big that, I mean, it's not like they didn't have to do it because they did have to do it. And certainly they suffered in the long run, but initially they knew about the hacks and they didn't say boo. And whether that's because they figured it wasn't that important or because they didn't want the bad press, I mean, they're big enough that, I mean, they survived it. They're not as good as they were a few years ago, and certainly their reputation took a hit. But then, you know, switch over to, you know, I don't use a fake ISP because I don't want (laughs) to name an existing company. So Giant City Cable. Giant City Cable, if if there's a security issue with Giant City Cable, first of all, they may not know about it. But then if they do know about it, even if they inform you, where do you go after that? I mean, then there's Giant Phone Company, you know, service instead. But I mean, our number of choices for ISPs is is really limited. I mean, so what do you do then? There's definitely a lot of trust that you put into all of these ISPs out there, and it really is trust. (laughs) Or lack of options. Um, I mean, mean, not to... I I don't trust my local cable company with whom I have my internet service. I have my internet service with the, you know, provider that made the most sense, that, you know, cost me the least, that, that, that gave me exactly what I wanted to give them. But I mean, it's not like I have 10 people in a room that I can say, okay, I trust you over the nine others. It's sort of like, okay, I've got, you know, choice A or choice B. And more often it seems like that's going to come down to cost than it is going to be, oh, I definitely trust Ma Bell or, oh, I definitely trust, you know, Cable Town or whichever one I happen to be using. (laughs) No, I see that too. But we're getting a little bit, we're actually getting a little bit off the topic though. So I, I, (sighs) <laughs> I'm beginning to think that this is much more multifaceted than we're going to be able to solve today, but let's go to a different, let's go a different direction. You talked about the vulnerability of the light bulb. I'm used to, I use a Mac, I use an iPhone, right? Those things tell me, Hey, there's an update for your computer and you should go ahead and and install that. Or there's an update for your iPhone or your iPad. Or, you know, if you have an iPhone or an Apple watch, your phone will tell you, Hey, there's an update for your Apple watch. There's no screen on my light bulb. I mean, do I really, every time I buy a smart device, do I have to add that to a list and then, you know, read the the print that's actually too fine to read if your eyes are like mine and find out where a security thing might be and then just start going there every month? Or is there a better way to handle that? No, unfortunately, that's... That's pretty much it because you're not, you know, with your Mac or your your iPhone, you're using it on a daily basis. You're you're actually physically looking at the screen for it. You're interacting with it. With the the light bulb, you might be using third party software. You might be using an Echo or or uh, you know uh, upcoming uh, HomePod, something like that, to interact with it. You're not actually, uh, you know, there's not a screen on the light bulb. You're even if you're using the app for the light bulb manufacturer, it may or may not be set up to show you those kind of alerts. Uh, one thing I have noticed personally was with some internet connected um, security cameras, you can sign up for, for security update emails, like sign up for their mailing list and they'll let you know, but they also use the same mailing list to spam you with their ads. <laughs> right. So it was something I very quickly unsubscribed from, which, you know, is really... In that sense, the, they're like, you know, their marketing department's like, yeah, we can get more sales out of this. Right. And I'm sure the security guys are like, oh, seriously? <laughs> because you're not going to have customers who are going to want to stay signed up for it, and they're not going to know about security issues. Yeah, you need to have those segmented lists. Mm-hmm. So it's only sending them security updates. And in most of these devices are having their own apps for it. Mm-hmm. Um one of the light bulbs that I use will let you know that there's a update available and basically 
you get a push the update to the connected device but for this light bulb in particular it doesn't do it on its own so you basically interact with the light bulb via their app <laughs> and it does its thing while you're on the wi-fi network and correct me if i'm wrong but the individual light bulb having its individual app just adds another point of vulnerability I mean, a potential point of vulnerability. I mean, obviously, you need an application. You need something to be able to interact with the light bulb. That's why you got a smart light bulb. Otherwise, what you would do is just screw in a light bulb <laughs> and, and go over and turn on the switch like a caveman. But I mean, if you I mean, so if you buy like a ten dollar uh, light bulb from yeah, Walgreens and I, I hate that I'm using any real names because I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying, oh, those, those light bulbs at Walgreens are terrible because I don't know anything about smart light bulbs at Walgreens. I don't even know if they sell them. But if you buy a $10 light bulb at Walgreens and it says, hey, go here and download our app. Okay, well, I bought a light bulb from a brand that I've never heard of, and now I'm just going to download their app. And yes, the app might have survived you know, going through the iOS app store review process, but I still don't know exactly what's happening with that app. I, I And I guess sort of what I'm driving to, and I'm not trying to sell anybody on the idea of HomeKit, but you talked earlier about trust. I have an iPhone. I have an Apple TV. I have an Apple Watch. I've got more Apple stuff that I'm forgetting about right this second. I trust Apple. Apple has HomeKit. There are certain hoops that companies have to jump through to be HomeKit certified. Is HomeKit enough for me? I mean, can I stop worrying if all of my smart light bulbs play well with HomeKit, if all my, if my smart blender uh, plays with HomeKit, if all of my smart stuff plays with HomeKit, can I go ahead and breathe a sigh of relief and just, you know, live like a Jetson? I, I wouldn't say you could totally stop caring because, you know, you're always going to want to keep an eye out for security stuff. But yeah. that definitely, I would recommend it. I, like, there's been a lot of discussion in the security world about how there really should be some sort of consortium for Internet of Things devices. So basically some some way to put a stamp of approval on a device saying this has passed certification by this governing body. And of course, there's nothing. There's no governing body. There's no centralized consortium that's making sure everybody's playing by the rules. Um, so the next best thing you have is something like HomeKit, where Apple's got their own review process, a stringent review process. They kind of are the final arbiter on deciding who gets in or who doesn't get into the program. And you're going to know that the companies that, that took the time to pass the the uh, requirements for HomeKit that basically showed that they cared enough about security and privacy to bother becoming certified, that's a step in the right direction in the first place. So that's definitely going to – would make me feel more secure. So there's a whole other side to this conversation that I want us to have. That's how I keep my light bulb secure. But my light bulb lights my room. Or if I have a fancy one, my light bulb changes the color of the light in my room. And that's still what I think of my light bulb as doing. How is it that my light bulb becomes part of a dedicated dial of service attack? How is it that my light bulb becomes a thing? How is my light bulb sending spam email to people? It's a light bulb. But it's connected to the internet. Well, so what though? I mean, it's connected to the internet, but it's still, it's still a light bulb. I mean, what is the, what is the hidden power there that goes from illumination uh, to world domination? Let's say. Well, the the hidden power there is that your light bulb isn't just a light bulb. Your smart light bulb. That is, it's it's not just a light bulb. Right. Um, it's a little computer. It's got a little you know chipset in there to run its little thing to change your light colors and all that other stuff and that's um it can do a lot more than that and that's because of uh basically the way things work with mass market production when you are a company and you're like okay i want to build a, a smart light bulb what's the cheapest way to source my parts Creating your own circuitry, your own chipset for the light bulb from scratch is going to be prohibitively expensive unless you're a really big company, unless you're the nest of light bulbs and you're saying, oh, I, I'm going to you know, do this uh, from point A to point B. This is all in-house. Mm -hmm. um, all the engineers, everything. Exactly. So if you're just a smaller company, no, you're going to go buy a general use chipset that can do what you want to do. It could do other stuff because it's made for general purpose use and it's really cheap because 
It's been manufactured in these massive quantities. It's wholesale pricing, all that stuff. Wait, wait, so, wait. Hold on before you go further. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the the same chip that powers a generic sort of um, Android tablet, let's say, or even like a burner phone, the same chip that powers that could be cheap enough that that's what's powering my light bulb. Theoretically, it's only doing the little thing that the light bulb wants to do, but you've still got all this excess computing power sitting there in your light bulb that somebody else could could use, could program, could change. I, I don't know if I'd go as far as saying like an Android tablet or a burner phone would share the same chipset, but it's definitely true that the same chipset will be shared across many IoT devices. So you'll have light bulbs or, you know, I don't know, smart smart water filters or whatever you have you. Uh, you will ha- have the same chipset shared across a bunch of those devices, which is why, for example, when one webcam manufacturer was hit with a vulnerability, it turned out a whole lot of other cameras were affected because they all use the same chipset. Even though they're different companies, they all sourced from the same supplier. And, and that's one of the major issues there is because the chips are so multi-purpose and you know, they can work in different scenarios, you'll have a lot of different devices across a lot of different brands using the same same chip. But as far as how you take that from the step of changing the color of your light bulb to sending spam, that's where the kind of the vulnerability and the computer programming side of things come in. The software that's running on your smart light bulb is meant to turn on your light, change the color, maybe run a timer, whatever. Mm-hmm. If, let's, on the other side of the coin, let's say your iPhone. Your iPhone software that comes from Apple is built to make calls, download apps from the App Store, surf the web, check your email. When people jailbreak their iPhones, they do it to allow them to run stuff on their iPhone that Apple didn't authorize, that Apple didn't necessarily okay. You know, I want my phone to be able to do all this sorts of stuff. I don't like the normal home screen. I want you know, some different way of setting it up. I'm going to jailbreak my phone. Well, in the same regard that people uh, jailbreak their phones to to run stuff that the phone wasn't intended to, I guess you could think of it as jailbreaking your light bulb. Uh, you know, the bad guy would, when they hack your light bulb to make it do stuff it's not supposed to, it's kind of the same thing as jailbreaking iPhone. You are exploiting a vulnerability to install some software that was not meant to necessarily run on that device and make it do things it wasn't meant to do by the manufacturer. Okay, that is a really interesting way to think about it. So basically what you're saying, it's like sideloading an app onto yeah. your light bulb. I mean, I think the thing, the thing that befuddles me is it just never occurred to me that there was enough processing power besides, you know, turning on a light, turning off a light, dimming a light, changing the color, maybe. It never occurred to me that there would be excess processing power in that. But of course, I mean, if somebody's got a barrel of chips. No, that's that's just what the manufacturer wanted to program it to do, but the the actual power of it could be a lot more. They just purchase that chipset. They're just using that functionality to run their functions on top of it. <laughs> so it's like if somebody, okay, so like years ago, and this still happens today, if all you do is check email, maybe check Facebook, surf the web, I would argue all you need is an iPad, which is still a very powerful thing. But a lot of people think they still need a computer. And so they buy a lot more power than they need to do these simple things. The same could be said for the chipsets and some of these devices. They're buying more power than they need, not because they think they need something that powerful, but just because it's cheaper to buy that than it is yes. to design something that does less. And, and another thing to to keep in mind is that when we're talking about processing power and excess processing power and being able to do stuff besides change the color of your light, the internet as we know it, all the networking code, all the stuff that makes the internet work the way it does, I mean, that was developed years and years ago, you know, in the 60s, the 70s, like it's, I mean, this stuff is old code, relatively speaking. Mm-hmm. And it, the processing power back then was minuscule compared to what we have now in our pockets with iPhones and, and iPads. It was, I mean, it was really minuscule. It's, it's insane. You think about the fact that the, I, think, I believe it's like the general uh, iPhone or smartphone has more processing power than the lander for the moon. Right. The Apollo program. I mean, that's that's insane. So think about that. The networking code that was written back then in the late 60s, 70s, that didn't have the hardware 
I guess they didn't have the you know a lot of processing power, a lot of memory, a lot of speed. So they made do with what they had. So it's very robust code. It does what it can do with very little resources. So when we're talking about extra overhead to be able to do stuff that's not you know beyond changing the color of your light bulb, it doesn't take a whole lot when you think of it in terms of adding a, a network stack and being able to do stuff like hey, I want my device to be sending spam or I want my device to be participating in a denial service attack. Um, or in that case, I guess it would be a hacker saying, I want this device. You know, you don't want, necessarily want to be hacking your own device like that. Right. <laughs> uh, but that that's that's kind of where it's at is it doesn't take a whole lot to add that kind of capability to a device as long as it meets you know the minimum threshold uh, of requirements. So I'm guessing then, and it seems like we've, I mean, it's amazing to me how many times we come back to this idea that it's really just a numbers game. I mean, here's the thing. Even if you hack my light bulb to send spam, I'm imagining, and I understand there's a lot more power in my light bulb than I realized there was before. But even if you hack my light bulb to send spam, it's only one light bulb. There's only so much it can do. But if my light bulb is vulnerable, there's a good chance that my next door neighbor's light bulb is vulnerable as well, as well as a guy just like me living halfway around the world, and then a guy like me living the rest of the way around the world, which I guess would actually take us back to me. This becomes a numbers game, right? I mean, if you find one vulnerable device, you've found 50 or 50,000 or, or, or 50 million. I mean, it's not about my light bulb. It's about all the light bulbs literally exactly like mine that might be just as insecure. And beyond that is not just the light bulbs. There's the webcams. It's uh, you know the smart refrigerators. It's the smart coffee makers. Whatever device and crazy thing we've hooked up to the internet, if it's vulnerable, it can be used in an attack like that. And yes, there are millions and millions of devices like that around the world. And so, as you said, when you find a vulnerability in one, you found a vulnerability in a lot more than just one, and that adds up. And it's not just sending spam. I mean, it could be to give further access to your network. There's so much you could do with all of these devices. Well, yeah. I mean, it, what's what's been fascinating about this conversation that we're having today, we've talked about the cloud before, and I understand completely, and it's been driven home to me by doing this show over the past year, but, I mean, when you store something in the cloud, you're not storing something in the cloud. You're storing something on someone else's computer. Okay. Your smart light bulb, yes, is a light bulb, but it's a light bulb with a computer attached. And I think that's the thing. That's where, that's sort of where the disconnect is. I think of my light bulb as a light bulb. And a light bulb is a light bulb unless it's a smart light bulb, in which case it's a computer that can do fun things with light. Or, you know, a teddy bear is a teddy bear. But if it's a smart teddy bear, then it is a computer, you know, with stuffing all around it and like a, and a cute little kid-friendly shape. I mean, that really is the thing. I mean, the, the Internet of Things is not the Internet of Things. It's an Internet of computers attached to things. Exactly. And so anything you can do with a computer on a different scale, I mean, obviously you're not going to be, well, probably, although, huh, can you hack a light bulb to, uh, to start mining Bitcoin? Uh, let, let's, <laughs> let's not talk about that today because... Um, you know, my head is almost full with what we've got. Hey, I want to let people know, though, this is the kind of thing. Well, the kind of questions that we hit today are the kind of questions that we would like to keep hitting in the future. We've got one lined up for next week. I want to know what the S does. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, well, you'll need to tune in next week and find out. But is there like a is there a security thing that, you know, but you don't know why we would love to hit that question? And uh, the way you can get that question to us is checklist at securemac.com. The address, again, is checklist at securemac.com. There are things that we all know. I mean, there are things we all know. I mean, they are just truisms, but we don't know why they're true. That is one of those that kind of perplexes you from an Internet security side or from, a, from an information security side or a security side, let's say. The address is checklist at securemac.com. Uh, we're going to have notes for this show. Of course, we have notes for all of the past shows as well. If you would like to check those notes, uh, the address is securemac.com slash checklist. That address, again, is securemac.com slash checklist. And I know I'm doing this out of order, but, you know, checklist and secure Mac are the things to remember. And the way to remember that is you're listening to The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>